Okay, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is going to be a lot simpler than what Jeff was going uh, through. Um, we'll have a little bit of preliminary, hopefully, we'll, that will introduce uh, what Marty is, is up to. And I just have a couple of insights that I'd like to portray. And, and Ken asked me to talk about the value of information and the calculations of such things with reference to climate sensitivity. Um, so uh, here's uh, among the things that I'm going to try to convince you of. Um, if you're thinking about the value of information um, for things like climate sensitivity or other manifestations of climate change, um, strikes me that it's uh, the answer to uh, how to do it is it depends. The answer to every economic question is how it uh, is that it depends. In this case, I think it depends on what decisions are going to be made about what, for whom, under conditions of uncertainty, um, with what different types of criteria the decisions are being considered, uh, what is the decision space that's offered to the decision maker to frame the approach to the conversations he or she has to have with him or herself and staff uh, to try to figure out what to do. Um, the range of possible states of nature, if they can be probabilistically uh, demonstrated and represented, fine. Uh, if not, um, think uh, in a systematic way about what it is you are um, moving forward. Um, the priors, the subjective priors that decision makers have coming into their conversations matter. Their attitudes towards risks matter. Um, the timing of the decision matters, and the character of the decision matters. By the way, before I get too far, Ken, when you, it, your interpretation of that gray area of the range of the climate sensitivity in the fifth assessment report, um, you correctly identified that they used their uncertainty language, but they did not mean that there's a 66 to 100 percent chance that the climate sensitivity estimates is in that range. It was more of a, this is the interquartile range or something like that. They, they, people, they screw that sort of stuff up all over the time. <laughs> okay, so potential criteria for simple-minded approaches to this, economic values, expected values, um, but the tails are important, risk-based metrics. Um, if you want to include some degree of aversion to risk, you could calculate certainty equivalents. That's sort of what Stern did in a very elaborate way. Um, you can think about thresholds um, on reality-based uh, policy makers, uh, decision makers, social norms that seem to reflect what people want to do. Um, but uh, it's important to notice that these metrics depend on timing and aversion to risk. And the conversations are usually, you know, especially with things like climate sensitivity, think about climate policy as mitigation, but there's also the adaptation uh, going on. And information uh, about climate sensitivity can influence those uh, decisions as well. Here's some preliminary examples of the sorts of approaches that um, began. Um, the most recent, um, uh, Bill's new book, um, reflecting approaches to uncertainty. Man and Rituals began uh, a, a good deal of the conversation about hedging and generated the notion that you can either learn and then act or act and then learn. Um, and the fundamental result from the fourth assessment report for my money is that approaching uh, policy decisions in the climate arena has to involve an iterative risk management approach. It makes it messier because you're not generating internally consistent, necessarily economic um, uh, conclusions or trajectories for long periods of time. What you're doing is, is uh, taking into note <coughs> that we're just going to write climate policy for the next 100 years this year. Um, you'll do it iteratively and make some mid-course corrections. Um, and that makes the, the problem and the questions and the approaches a little bit different. IBCC wrote that. 2007 in the synthesis report, the National Research Council adopted it. In America's Climate Choices, the National Climate Assessment has adopted that perspective. Um, so from that perspective, um, what are the fundamental sources of uncertainty on the mitigation side? Uh, this is a, a set of graphs and figures from 
the Stabilization Committee of the National Research Council that was chaired by uh, Susan Solomon. Um, the approach to the iterative risk management on the mitigation side has to do with cumulative emissions over medium time periods that are medium long, not 100 years, but 30 or 40 years. Um, they are informed by the notion that one of the fundamental drivers of global mean temperature over the long term is cumulative emissions from the beginning until um, when they uh, sort of disappear uh, into the, from the emissions flow. This uncertainty graph is a little bit different than usual. It says um, long-run equilibrium global mean temperature change and estimates of the cumulative emissions over the long term that would support those. And the uncertainty bear bounds there give you an idea of the uncertainty around which you have to frame the conversation. What are the interim cumulative emissions targets for an iterative risk-based approach to that? Um, I did a little bit of uh, that sort of work uh, a while ago with uh, Michael um, Schlesinger. Um, fundamentally, what we observed is that um, shooting for one temperature target in the context of a variety of different uh, climate sensitivities from a degree and a half up to nine degrees centigrade um, had the potential of closing doors so that you couldn't get there. So if you were shooting at three degrees and suddenly found out you wanted to go to two, um, even if you started right away, uh, you wouldn't be able to get there for some of these uh, circumstances. But uh, if you don't do anything through 20, 2035, you close more doors than that. That is a value of information not calibrated in currency, but it gives you an idea of what the tails that you might want to worry about could look like. Here is the um, uh, illustrative graph that comes out of Energy Modeling Forum 20-something, 20 26, 22, whatever. But it was picked up by the Limiting Panel of America's Climate Choices. And so this calculation was, OK, um, between now and 2050, let's behave as if we want to go to 550 parts per million. Um, what are the cumulative emissions that would be consistent for that for the globe? And what is the U.S. share of, of those budgets? Um, and it was either somewhere between 170 and 200 gigantons uh, in, certain, in uh, emissions CO2 equivalents uh, over that 40-year time period. The notion then is sometime before 2050, this calculation and consideration is redone uh, reflections of the risk associated with further warming is redone on the basis of new information about climate sensitivity and the potential that new information could tell you a little bit more about whether the tail is thick or how big it is or what's going on, as well as what the damages look like, what the transients look like, how well countries are participating in emissions trajectories, and so on. Um, so in that world, the value of information about climate sensitivity is the value of being able to more for formally understand what the mid-course correction might look like and identify the pace at which you should be making the observations on climate sensitivity and hopefully the learning pattern um, so that you can announce what's going to be the mid-course correction in enough time that it's not a sudden surprise to anybody. Um, I can do this one. Uh, I'm in front of Marty. Marty is, is, has been a spectacular contributor to lots and lots of stuff across economics. And fundamentally, what he does is take really, really, really complicated problems, <clears throat> dilute them down to their most fundamental nature so that you can work the problem, generate some insight from that, that is perfectly generalizable and uh, informs enormous amounts of, of work in the complex world that uh, he simplified. So <clears throat> I've got a simple model to suggest this value of information and the sensitivity with respect to uh, priors and things. It's just a little simple decision tree. Um, two possible states of nature, um, two adaptations, two actions. Um, and the subjective probabilities that decision makers will undertake are informed by 
the information that they come in with. So where does climate sensitivity come in? Uh, it might ask you or cause you to change um, the subjective priors that you enter. The observation is that if you use these particular concepts and do a little bit of arithmetic, what you can get are ranges of ambiguity of the decision uh, that you will undertake depending on the, on the, the t decision rule that you're using, expected outcome or certainty equivalence. No big no news there. Um, but you also can compute the value of information according to those uh, specific uh, approaches. And um, the value of information depends on the subjective prior that people come in with. So the value of information itself could change as we learn more about distributions of things like climate sensitivity, not only because the prior changes and so these calculations you're doing um, change, but also the decision that you take might actually be different. Um, the last bit I wanted to talk about is, man, I said a little bit about it in that, that iterative bit uh, through 2050. Um, but there's also the notion that the timing of decisions uh, can be informed by the way in which you look at how the uns uncertainty will unfold. There are, as Jeff said, a lot of climate impacts for which the local, regional, subcontinental uncertainty uh, spans zero, uh, causes some degree of difficulty. There is <clears throat> the notion, for example, of large coastal storms and hurricanes, and then the question is what have we detected and attributed it of, of changes in the intensity and frequency of those storms to human-induced climate change? Um, and that argument continues to rage. But there are things that we know a little bit more about, and that is the implications of sea level rise on damages associated with all kinds of storms, not just the fat tails. Um, and you could begin to think about an adaptation project that might be very expensive um, to protect yourself from most of the tails of the distribution, um, depending on how it evolves over time. So this is a paper, uh, it's been a while now, um, that I did with Paul Kirshen and Kathy Nee, um, looked at weather distribution patterns, historical records for an urban area in Boston for which somebody had already done the calculation of what an adaptation protection barrier uh, would cost. Um, we then had distributions associated with those weather events uh, on economic cost. And you can move them forward simply by changing sea level rise and the manifestation of a 25-year storm um, that um, might be the 25-year storm in, in today's world uh, ends up looking like the 50- or 75-year storm in today's world 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. So you do all of that, you can make some calculations of internal rate of return um, based either on people who are risk averse uh, or people who are not um, and uh, the risk neutral. Um, and you can calculate how those trajectories of uh, calculations of internal rate of return change over time to get an idea of when you might want to undertake the investment in this protection project. If you use a 4% um, cutoff rate for your decision uh, along a six, 60 centimeter sea level rise uh, trajectory, it looks like um, Long about 2040, it might be a good time to do it. But along a 100 centimeter sea level rise trajectory, it looks a lot like you better do it somewhere around 2020 or 2025. Um, what would be the value of improved information on climate sensitivity that would allow you to make adjustments on your subjective view of whether it's more likely that we're going to be 60 centimeters or 100 centimeters um, is uh, relatively critical and the timing that's imposed and suggested here that it would be really nice if we had that information in the next 10 or 15 years uh, for at least that decision 
works out. Now, that's not a ubiquitous decision. The numbers are specific to the place. Um, but that's the sort of conceptual visualization of value information that isn't based on the numerical calculations. Um, the one thing, the one last thing I want to put up as, as uh, a thing for conversation is how do, how do, I'm going to be much shorter than that. Uh, how do we think about communicating what we know and what we don't know uh, in a way that is consistent with the complexity that Jeff was talking about, the catastrophes that Marty is going to be talking about, and the uncertainties and the fundamental uncertainties that are just going to take an enormous amount of time uh, to resolve. So one question that has been in the back of my mind for a couple of years now, and I actually, after I figured out how to say it like this, found out that Steve Schneider said it like this a long time ago. But the notion is, you have to tell the truth, and you have to tell nothing but the truth. But do you have to tell the whole truth? Don't know. <laughs> Thank you.